I'm joined now by Michael Van Hessel, Vice President of Expert Services at OnFido. Together, we're going to discuss how AI can be used to address the current fraud crisis, the misconceptions about machine learning, and how to stay ahead in the ongoing fraud arms race. Michael, thank you for joining me today. Thank you, Peter. Happy to be here. I'm, I'm, the feeling is mutual as always. I love to love to talk with Onfido specifically about this topic, and uh, let's just get started here. So, Onfido recently launched its fifth annual identity fraud report, and this is coming at a really fascinating time. Fraud is reaching unprecedented levels, as we talked about earlier today on this stage, and bad actors are using advanced AI tools. But there's kind of a difference now, which is that the identity verification space is finally mainstream enough and mature enough to actually significantly fight back. So my first question is from an identity verification perspective, what techniques are fraudsters using most in 2023? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Uh, of course, they're using a lot of different techniques. Uh, if, if we compare it with 2021, 2020, 2022, 2023, um, but what sticks out the most when I bring it back to a top three, I would say one is document manipulation. Uh, what we saw a couple of years back is that uh, mostly they were creating fake documents starting from scratch, eh? getting a template online and, and it was easier and faster to start from scratch. Whereby now uh, we have seen a notable swing towards digitally altering smaller areas of the document. So instead of creating a completely new document, they're attacking existing documents. That's one. Um, going to biometrics, what we see, uh, the biometric fraud rates are increasing. Uh, the, the, the average biometric fraud rate this year is higher than we have ever seen before year to date. And then, of course, uh, deep fakes and cheap fakes, uh, the AI generated uh, yeah, videos and, and impersonations of people. Uh, the availability of online tools and generative AI nowadays uh, has contributed to a huge surge in, in deepfake attempts. Mm -hmm. So it's really attacking small parts in a document. Uh, we see more and more biometric fraud and, uh, and heavily increased numbers of, uh, of deepfakes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's it's really interesting. I mean, we've talked about it earlier this year, I believe, um, actually speaking with Onfido, but there are even, um, you know, it, ways to outsource these cheap fakes and deep fakes now. So it, it really is becoming its own like black market industry. So That's um, true. It, 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 in the past, it was pretty expensive and time consuming to create your own deep fake. Uh, mm -hmm. But now with the, uh, yeah, call it professional amateurs, that are that are sharing the knowledge online and on the online platforms. Yeah, it, it's more accessible to to everybody basically, mm -hmm. and that's why we see the increase there. Uh, so one of the most fascinating insights from this report is that the hybrid work models that we've seen as a uh, as a result of the pandemic have led to really non uniform work hours. We used to work nine to five. And now it, we're working 24 seven, seven days a week, you know, working on weekends, working at midnight, working at 3 a.m., whatever works for your schedule. And it's really great, but that also means that fraudsters have a greater attack surface. And it's an example of something that I really love to talk about, which is how our culture is really just as important as our technology when it comes to security. How do you go about reliably defending fraud at scale? you know, because this is a global phenomenon in these moments of a cultural shift. Yeah, definitely. It, it, it's a global phenomenon. It's what, what we see in, in practice, when we go a couple of years back, we had a pre-pandemic eh, when, when they were taking from, from Monday to Friday, uh, where we saw there was a big spike on a Tuesday, just after the weekend, and then towards the weekend, it got less. Uh, what we have seen over the past two years is that it really shifted to, uh, as you mentioned, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. And it, that's challenging, especially for the companies that need to protect themselves against, uh, against fraudulent attacks. Um, what, we, yeah, what we see there, or the, the warning we always provide is, is it's be careful of your downtime. Eh? It, it's fraudsters 
especially in the past, but now seven days a week, were attacking you at, at the downtime of your company. Maybe you didn't have enough employees on shift eh, that needed to do a document check or a biometric check. Uh, so what I would advise is increase automation. Eh? Automation is there 24 seven. If you don't have the option to automate, make sure you're populating those non-traditional hours as equally as the traditional working hours. It doesn't matter anymore what time your your uh, flow is up or, or your programs are running. It's really 24-7. Mm -hmm. And if it's not possible to go for automation, nah, you, can, you can choose for other solutions. But of course, the extra benefit of automation is also that it's that it becomes cheaper. And you don't have the manual labor, the, the systems are running 24-7. And yeah, it, it's something to be aware of. And then fraudsters are specifically attacking you during the downtime of your uh, of your company. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And I mean, it's it's nice to be talking about this now, especially because you know a few years ago, like you know, let's say 2016, we would have been talking about this and and be talking about we need to develop an automated system for this. But it's available now, and you just need to deploy it. So it's That's a good. True. Good place to be in. <laughs> um, you know, speaking of a cultural shift, generative AI has made a huge pack, uh, impact on society this year. And it's also, I mean, that that goes on our side of the equation and also on the fraudster side of the equation. They've the Fraudsters have new powerful tools that they can use uh, to also automate their processes. Thankfully, you know, like I just mentioned, we have AI tools as well, but a recent uh, on Fido survey showed that 73% of companies that you surveyed in the US and UK, and you surveyed thousands of, of, of companies in this regard, have no plans to invest in AI for the purpose of cybersecurity and anti-fraud. What are the most common reasons that organizations are reluctant to deploy AI for the purpose of anti-fraud? Good question. Is it reluctance? That, that's the main question. Are they reluctant to deploy AI for anti-fraud? Eh? Or, or is it a lack of awareness? What I think. Hey, it's it's that's also in, in document authentication, uh, document training, which I provide for now uh, for over 20 years now already. Is it is it reluctance or awareness? And I think everything starts with education. So if there is more education, more explanation of what we're doing and how we are using AI as well in the protection against fraud, and we can bring people to other faults. At least that's what we hope to do. And many people hear AI and they think of the deep fake aspect. It's AI, it's scary, uh, and it's not, they don't think about the counter or protection against fraud aspects. AI is moving very fast right now, as we can see now, everywhere online, it, it, it's everywhere in the news. And in fact, if you look at our findings from our fraud report, uh, we've seen there is a 3,000% increase in detected deepfakes year over year. 3,000%. And then especially in the last six months of, of the year. So it's there. And again, it all starts with awareness. And looking beyond deepfakes, because fraud and generative AI, AI machine learning, it's not only about deep fakes. Yeah, I, I said it, it with your first question, uh, the document manipulation. We've seen five times more digital forgeries in 2023 compared to 2021. And what is a forgery? A forgery is an original document with alterations. So instead of a counterfeit, which is a complete reproduction, we see more digital forgeries with the use of AI again. And this means that organizations have been on the defense in, in, in the last few months, how I see it. Uh, it's been attack, detection, and countermeasure. It takes time and fraud detection partner to shift to offensive. So instead of that defensive mode, you need to shift to offensive, yeah, where you can start to evaluate and predict the attack factors before they affect your business. Mm -hmm. be, there, yeah. Yeah, be there on time. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you really have to be proactive about it. But I, I, I like 
your reframing of of the topic because it's not necessarily a reluctance and we saw this just with general biometrics like just general biometric authentication is that people just need to be uh they need to learn about it they need to become comfortable with it it doesn't it needs to move from novelty to necessity i think yeah, yeah true and and you see it with with now is it reluctance or again awareness when it comes to ai now we're talking about fraud but you see it with those other uh, it, 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 assistants, uh, what, what you can find online. Uh, Chat GPT, for example. Uh, it, it is, people are getting scared of what a computer can possibly do. But it's with AI, it's still the thing. It's, it's, it's not a thinking mechanism on its own. Right. So you need to provide input for the output. You can train it, but but it's not... It's not like a human brain that is coming up with his own solutions. So. Exactly. Yeah. It reminds me of the, uh, I mean, it's not the early days of biometrics, but you, we, when you would go to, uh, people in our audience will remember, if you went to a, a, a biometrics conference about 10 years ago, everybody would play clips from Minority Report of Tom Cruise's eyeballs. And, yeah. <laughs> and it, was, it was like, okay, this is what people see, and there's a novelty to it, but it moves beyond that. But I digress. I, I'll get back to our conversation here. So Onfido has really made AI anti-fraud a major priority. You uh, unveiled that you have a fraud lab, uh, which is really, really fascinating uh, to have that kind of in-house R&D space for you folks. How does this lab fit into your R&D efforts and why is it important to have in-house testing like this fraud lab? Yeah, it's, it's, it's key. It, this is something that, that no, I can advise to also the other companies that are working in this fraud space. Um, to have an internal, no, you can call it the lab, we call it the fraud lab, that, that is doing the testing. And with that testing, we can make improvements as well. And our fraud lab, uh, I think the experts working in the fraud lab have approximately over 80 years of combined experience in, in, in the fraud landscape. Uh, and, and what we do with fraud lab is we provide knowledge, we look at processes, uh, and of course support into, into developing fraud detection solutions. Uh, and what we did internally is we developed an internal platform that is capable of replicating fraud samples on demand. And why do we do that? To train our systems. And sometimes I call it the internal battle. We are trying to attack our own system uh, and we try to beat our own system. And if we can beat it, we know where we need to improve. And that's why it's so important to have these uh, internal capabilities to test. Um, so what does it mean with the fraud lab? Uh, we're able to pull data from real life fraud samples. So we look at the different fraud samples, we pull the data and we can retrain our internal models uh, for faster countermeasures deployment. Mm -hmm. That's basically what it is. So it's, if you want to catch a fraudster, think like a fraudster. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, it's, you know, the, this whole conversation we've been talking about, like the, it's sort of two, two worlds that operate the same way, just on the different sides. It's like you're fighting your doppelganger. I, I, I'm reminded of all of these movies, you know, where it's like a rooftop showdown between the fraudster and the anti-fraudster, and you're all doing the same thing. And it's about, you know, who's a little bit more ready for this in order to... Yeah. To... Yeah, many, many people in this space, they, they still call it the cat and mice game. Eh? And, and one day we are one step ahead and the other day the fraudsters are one step ahead. Exactly. It's yeah. an ongoing game. I'm playing this year for over, or I'm playing this game for over 20 years now and I still <laughs> like it. And then sometimes I get a question, will we ever win? I don't think so. Uh, but as mentioned, yeah, it, it's depending on the day. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. Well, I mean, like talking directly about that cat and mouse game, things that have kind of evolved, you know, we, we've been talking around this, but there are sort of two ways that uh, fraudsters are exploiting um, ID documents and bi biometrics. Those are the, the two ways. How are ID documents and biometrics as fraud vectors unique? And do they have any common elements when it comes to how we can address them? 
Yeah, on, on one end, they're unique because one is a document and the other is a face. Mm -hmm. uh, but look at them, yeah, look at both of them together, the document and the biometric fraud, they have similar elements. And picking those similar, ele uh, similar elements, um, we can create certain checks and basically we check the same things on both. And looking at a document, but also biometrics, is facial similarity. And we, we need both. We need both a document and a selfie or a liveness video uh, to look at facial similarity. And it's a score based on the similarity of facial features. Mm -hmm. uh, other checks that we're doing, spoof detection uh, tests. We need to make sure that it's not a 2D or a 3D mask when it comes to biometrics. Is it a video of a video? Uh, is it a repeated document photo? So again, is the repetition there? It, it's looking at the photos. It's looking at the minor details. And yeah, we were discussing the the AI generated uh, deep fakes, but also documents. What they're doing, they're using similar yeah, code, similar systems to to create both the document and the biometric check. Um, also, what we do is the known faces check, um, and, and faces come, they become known as they become a repeated attribute. Mm -hmm. uh, that, what that does mean is if a fraudster onboards on your platform as a bank or a gambling company or, or a hotel, what you do, and they are reusing certain data or they're using their own face, but they use documents which they detect. Um, by checking against the face, so have we seen this face before on your platform for a specific client? Yeah, we are able to catch more uh, more fraudsters, basically. Mm -hmm. It's the reuse of, of information on documents and in biometrics that, that yeah, makes it for us easier to catch them. Absolutely. It's really interesting to see these worlds of, you know, essentially what we used to just sort of term in the silo of OCR and biometrics <laughs> finally meet together in your fraud lab. It's great. <laughs> yeah, and they should be together. Eh? You can you can you know, look at them in silo, but but we always say, especially within the fraud lab and our internal fraud teams, uh, it's connected cases. When you look at something in silo, it's just one one thing or just one fraud attack. But when we can connect all those those tiny dots, uh, yeah, then you will have the or you will have an overview of the larger fraud rings. Exactly. Yeah, we're seeing uh, really across the board in the biometrics industry a, a really holistic approach to all of this, and it's really been helping. Um, and then also further to, like you said, they they should never have been in a silo in the first place. The reason we use our face is because it's already on our ID. It would be so much easier to detect AI deepfakes if we put our hands on our uh, photos instead, and then when the AI came up with it, it would have like an extra finger or something. Uh, yeah, just is, a finger finger finger. Finger. yeah, another discussion. What we sometimes say in it, that's from my, my background when I was working with physical documents and checks, we always said the ear is, is, is a very unique fingerprint. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that, that becomes a little bit weird eh? if you need to make yeah. sure. Ears, you ears. don't want a border guard looking at a picture of your ear and then looking at your ear. That's very uncomfortable. Yeah, it's not very yeah. user friendly. <laughs> exactly. Um, so we're we're just about out of time here, but I have another question for you. Uh, as you mentioned, this this really is a cat and mouse game. It's an arms race. I mean, that's the title of this session. How do you expect AI enhanced fraud to evolve? in the near future from your position? And what are the best steps that our audience members can take to be prepared for it? Yeah, now, Peter, I, I think we can we can say here and that you agree, uh, we can pretty accurately speculate that AI is here to stay. It's here, it will only becomes better and better and better. And it will, will evolve. Uh, deep fakes will continue to increase. And we already saw a spike of 3,000 percent over the over the last year. So, so AI and deepfake technology becomes even more accessible and easier to use for yeah, the common person. Uh, um, I think as well that it's getting harder and harder to detect fraud with the naked eye. I always said in the past, I come from the physical world that every, you could spot everything with your naked eye. Now with all these, these advanced technologies, it becomes more and more difficult. 
So the digital technologies have gotten too advanced. So that, that's something to be aware of. Um, now, an advice for me as well, if, if you build a solution, always use a combination of document and biometric. And that document alone doesn't tell you who is uploading the document. You also want to know if it's a real person and if it's really the legal holder of that document that you're checking. It's preventing fraud, preventing against deep fakes. Um, also, a recommendation that I can make is use an SDK instead of API. And, and, and by using the SDK, we can control the capture. Uh, we can use the device intelligence behind it. So we can check the document, we can check biometrics, but there is a lot of information that we are receiving as well when somebody uh, when something is is sent to us via SDK. Mm -hmm. and these tools give you more control from source to finish, and have a higher have access to the device information and have yeah more consistent image quality. The better the quality, the better the result. Absolutely, yeah, and uh, once again, having that extra data coming in fits in with that holistic idea that we're talking about, helps you give, get that edge. Because again, it's all moving and you need every every little bit you can get. Well, Michael, this has been a pleasure. I'm sure we could talk all day, but uh, we're, we're out of time, unfortunately. No, that's yeah. <laughs> it's too bad. We'll talk again soon, I'm sure. But in the meantime, how can folks in the audience get in touch with you and on Fido to learn more? Um, if they just visit our website, onfido.com, uh, they can also download, download our latest uh, identity fraud report, which is just launched a couple of weeks back, uh, or visit our virtual booth and then you can download it as well. Um, there is also a webinar which is recorded uh, last week, uh, and it will walk through several of the learnings from the report as well. So that is just interesting to see uh, what's happening on our end and what's happening in the virtual uh, the virtual world of document checking and biometric checking. Fantastic. Well, yes, and, and that's also a great reminder, folks, like the, uh, the res resources in the booths are still available. So head over there, check those things out. Michael, thanks again. I hope to talk to you again soon. This has been great. Thank you, Peter. Talk soon and have a nice day. You too.